I don't know what it was. He's walking upright like a man. Sightings in and around Vermont. Bigfoot sightings across New England have been reported. Red glowing eyes, about seven feet tall. Red eyes, big old fang claws coming out through. Three inches long, you know, just as sharp as they could be. There has been another UFO sighting flying over the Royal Botanic Gardens. There are 500 UFO sightings in the world every month. The truth is out there. Nice. I've just, I've just uh, accepted the fact that you have that now. As you should. Yeah. So it's a. It's we didn't a part talk of about life. it last episode, but I do want to talk about our adventures. Okay. Because they're yep. good. So we mentioned right. that you thought you pooped on a train. Yep, um, we did mention that. We did that. Went to uh, what was the Sakura Festival. Yeah. And that was yep, fun. We there was yep. um one. So I didn't say anything because I know I'm the only one who like. Like, because I could have stayed there the whole time, but I know I'm the only person who appreciates jazz, and I didn't want to enforce that upon oh, the group. Oh, I didn't know that you you were appreciating the jazz. Yeah, no, no, I, I would not. Now. I would not force that upon anyone. <laughs> so I, that's why I didn't even mention it. So there's some some great uh, uh, Japanese jazz. There was a costume contest, mm-hmm. but that was a play. Uh, yeah, it was a thing. The costume contest was a thing. They had a a, a trivia thing. It was a uh, bunny or cat and it was done by a guy who was dressed up as i think i want to say juliet from that one uh suda 78 game you know Uh the one i'm talking about right i know what you're talking about the one that uh uh jessica and yuri did the character for Mm -hmm. and uh So that that is fun. It's a beautiful place. The the trees are beautiful. And there's also mm-hmm. a play that I found fantastic. And I don't know if other people realize how fantastic it was until I said this is fantastic. Because mm-hmm. so imagine your traditional Japanese play. Per, people on stage in a kimono. They've got the big white masks on, <laughs> and they open it saying this is a traditional play. It's about a woman who's upset with her lazy husband. And then the music starts and they start dancing, and then. And then they pull out like a Donkey Kong hammer and she beats her husband to death with a hammer. And then yep. the children come out and the children help hide the body. And then yep. I went, oh, Japanese plays are the best. I never knew this is how they went. And it was great. And there's a statue of Totoro in the corner just because Totoro. Yep. I just liked it. And then, so the play, yeah. My my favorite thing is... um. When that happened, I said, uh, so that's what people have children for. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> and it suddenly made sense to me. Yeah, exactly. Who else is going to hide the body? It's easier when you've got helping hands. Mm-hmm. Uh, we rode a subway. There's a guy who had a, a breakdance themes completely around the subway, doing like backflips on the handrails and stuff. That I will was, say that was impressive. It, it, it was. There were some guys day drinking who really found mm-hmm. it impressive. Uh, yes. Because they're like, they, they they thought it should have been on YouTube. They loved it. Um, yes. They also, um, there was also a thing they were talking about where like no one's allowed to see hair? someone's hair or something. something. about, it's, I, again, you I, can't see a man's hair or something because it's yeah, against something. I, I don't know. It, it was a weird thread of conversation where I was just like, what is what is happening? It was. I mean, it smelled like a urinal cake, so that's to be expected. Speaking of urinal yeah. cakes, we walked past a group of people dressed as superheroes. I saw Iron Man peeing on the sidewalk, so that was fun. Um, I missed that, which was unfortunate. It was great. Uh, I saw someone trying and failing to walk in heels. Um, mm-hmm. We There was other subway rides. Um, then we went to a restaurant. That was mm-hmm. great. It's called yes. Ninja New York. And what happens mm-hmm. is you, you get off the subway, you go into a room, you open the door, and you're a small room painted completely black with a single mm-hmm. person in it. You tell them John's last name, and they whisper into a lapel mic. And then yep. black elevator doors open up, and you get into this elevator that has the dimmest light. It's like almost black in there. Yep. It goes down. I, I should, al- I sh- I this should is also all note, underground. Yeah. I should also note, as far as I'm concerned, 
you do have to say my last name to go down there because yes. I've never I've never gone there and not said my last name and gone down there. Yeah. So clearly that means you need to say my last name to get down. There. You have to say his last name to get down there. And then the opposing doors open into yet another completely black room. And then you go, "Huh, that's weird. Wonder where we should go." And you walk out of the elevator and a ninja jumps out and attacks you. And then you're like, well, the, you you panic, and then he's like, ah, you may take the ninja path. And the ninja path, as it turns out, is a winding stone path that goes up and down and swiggles left and right and opens into a room full of pagodas. And then a different ninja takes you to your own pagoda, and you sit down, and it's all like, everything's completely black, but the pagodas. So you sit down, there's like bamboo windows and the sliding paper doors. And it's this it's nice a big village. table. It's a ninja, vi- ninja village. And then and then you're eating. And then a ninja jumps out and stabs the table. Gah! Bang! And then it, ah! it's scary. Except no one scares John ever. Nope. And, nope. Uh, and they like slam the windows open. And it's all spooky and scary. And then you order your food. Your edamame comes out. It's smoking. Your dragon rolls come out. There's a dragon head breathing real fire out of it, out of your dragon That was really cool. I I never saw that before. That one was pretty cool. Also, in speaking to the the reason why I never got scared, I think I like your sister's theory the best. What's that? Oh, because... (laughs) (laughs) So I posted some pictures on my Instagram of uh, 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 the food there. And uh, I said, for some reason, John never got scared or or attacked. And she Mm -hmm. says... That's because he looks like he can throw a punch. <laughs> and I'll be fair. I'll be fair. Even though I cannot throw a punch, I do look like I can throw a yeah. punch. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, and then, so there's also not only jump out and stab the table ninjas with, like, a knife that, mm-hmm. if fingers are out, it sounds like it, it would hurt. Um, they're sneaky ninjas. And then sneaky ninja comes in sneaks now john and i are on the side of the table that can see sneaky ninja the other (laughs) members of the group are not on the side that can see sneaky ninja sneaky ninja sneaks past other people behind them with a shuriken in his hand holds said shuriken up to a different group member's neck and just sort of stands there and then he gives this look that says usually at this point people get scared and then he looks at us and gives like the i don't know what to do face and then sneaks back out and then it was the funniest thing ever. It was so funny. Also, our waiter's name was Ninja Ninja. So Ninja mm-hmm. Ninja comes back in and starts doing stuff. And he's clearly, like, alluding to, like, the group that we all know what happened. It was good. Also, at the end, a ninja does magic tricks. Yes. I tipped that ninja $20 because nice. I was impressed. Yeah. Also, Ninja was like, if you want more, I'm performing at day two of the Sakura Festival on the stage. You know, he said, he said the stage. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was pretty great. We had ninjas do magic, had ninjas attack, had ninjas be sneaky, had ninjas mm-hmm. give ice cream. It was good. Yeah, it was pretty good. There's I, like, and I had nothing bad to say about it. Yeah, I had no I had precisely no people hurl any kind of epithets at me. Nice. So that's going to New York City. That's always a win. There, although, 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 yeah, there was one extremely funny thing that you did not mention. What's that? When we were in uh, Times Square, yes. Uh, so if you've never been to a big city, mm-hmm. there's this problem in big cities with uh, these monks who go around <laughs> and yes. hand you stuff, uh, and then basically ask you to give them money, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I saw a man running away from one of these monks who was, <laughs> he was like, no, I don't want that. And the monk's like, no, take it. Yeah. And yeah. that's the only thing I saw, but it was a monk in sneakers running behind a man who just did not want to interact with that monk yeah. whatsoever. Yeah. It was pretty fantastic. <laughs> it was extremely fantastic. And I nearly died of uh laughter (laughs) oh it was pretty great it was pretty great no it was it was absolutely phenomenal (laughs) oh yeah i like they had a good time oh man oh also bathroom 
also done up all black, which I appreciate. The bathroom has bidets. Also appreciate mm-hmm. that. Things that weren't black in the bathroom, toilet paper. Definitely appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> the, so, funny story about those bidets. I went last year, and that bidet inspired me to buy a bidet. <laughs> uh, I ended up buying the wrong bidet, and I cried. <laughs> the end the end so uh anywho this is not a podcast about trips to uh cities that you may or may not be able to visit yeah <laughs> um this is a podcast about paranormal things i'd say okay. generally um because you know usually they're they exist outside of our Normal. Normal understanding. Therefore, paranormal. I prefer uh, preternatural. Preternatural? That's a good one, too. Because uh, I, I don't watched like that s- Netflix show. I did not. You totally did. It was the Supernatural? Haunt- no, the haunting one where there's like a ghost in the background of everything. Oh! <laughs> yes, that was very good. Yeah. That's uh, The Haunting of Hill House. Yes. Very good show. Recommended. I think we recommended <laughs> that back when we were watching it. Probably. But I could be wrong. Um, so each week, we pick a paranormal cryptid type entity. Okay. And uh, You're leading to this paranormal thing. I think I'm already getting hints at what your creature is. Okay. So um, Brandon's going to guess what the creature is. Well, no, you didn't I don't... give me any hints. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm setting them up for that. Oh, okay. oh, you're explaining what we do. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I'm explaining what we do, and it's also seven o'clock while I'm doing this, so I'm very tired and vamping <laughs> for time. Um, so the first sighting of this creature, based on my research, uh, at least this incarnation of it, okay, uh, was in the mid 13th century. Its okay. taxonomy is Philidae, and its region is Great Britain. Philo day. I'm just googling what Philo day is. It's it's a uh, cats. Okay, because that is not what came up when I googled it, and I will close that tab. Um, it's cats. It's 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 related to felines. My guess. Oh man, my guess is it's a type of psychopomp. Um, only because you were leaning into the supernatural. There's lots of black dogs. You said it's London, so it's not going to be a Scottish wild cat because wild cats are, are just about gone in Scotland. So I don't think English cats would be that weird to people unless it was like a churchyard cat that people thought was a psychopomp. So my guess is it's a black shuck cat equivalent. Um, You're pretty close. Okay. Uh, you're pretty close, but you didn't get the what it what it's called. I just dropped it into the folder. Okay. It is... Wait, um, wait, wait. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. So, tell me where in England, because I'm going to come up with a name for it. Surrey. Surrey? It's Surrey the, and, and, and uh, Budmir. Budman. It, it's the Surrey Puri. That's a pretty good name. Yeah. It's a Surrey Puma. Oh. Uh, and it's... it's Basically, what we're going to be talking about is alien big cats. Nice. Um... This is an extremely difficult subject to research. Oh, I believe it. And the reason for that is because 100% of all the sightings of alien big cats are, I saw a big cat. (laughs) Yeah. That's all of them. (laughs) So finding enough good information to fill a full episode was a nightmare. And why I finished it? This morning. I can believe it. So, um, let's take a a trip back through time Mm -hmm. to the 1800s. Um, there's a lot of bad stuff happening in America. There's a lot of bad stuff happening around the world because it's any time in human history. Um, (laughs) yeah. So, William Cobbett, a, uh, Billy C, as I call him. Yeah, yeah, Billy C. Uh, He recorded his travel through the English countries. Wow, let me try that one again. Yeah, who's got trouble with normal words now? Yeah, you're right. He recorded his travels through the English countryside 
and a set of serial articles which were published from 1822 to 1826 in the political register. Must have been nice He's... to be rich in that time period where you can just decide to travel and write a book and then that does well. Yeah, I mean, the fact of the matter is this man has a painting of himself. Well, I mean, and... I do too. <laughs> well, yeah, but a painting of himself in the 1800s. Yeah, okay. Yeah, um, and these were collected into a two-volume book, Rural Rides, in 1830, which he did the collection of them. Okay. So it, it's 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 one of those things um, where people write a bunch of articles and then they're responsible for it. Uh, <laughs> while the articles were largely to depict the lives of rural farmers, and I honestly don't know what his goal was because I tried yeah. to read it and understand, because um, he was like, there was there's a thing like he was anti corn laws huh which were giving putting tariffs on corn which if he was supporting rural farmers i thought he would be pro corn oh. laws because that encourages local growth but that was a whole bunch of it stuff it might be a whiskey thing um the corn tariffs so at least in scotland and ireland they mm -hmm. uh the british put a tax on um, malted oh. barley because they because they wanted to hurt the Irish. So the, Because what the, the, the British are great? Because the British are great. So what the Irish did, because they're like, we want to end, they were like, we want to kill all of your liquor to hurt them. So what the Irish mm -hmm. did, they just said, fine, we'll just not malt the barley. So that's why Irish whiskey is not malted. <laughs> 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 amazing yeah so um, my guess is it's something similar where there's a large okay. region that made yeah. liquor with corn and they're like let's hurt them and they probably said we'll just switch to not corn <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> uh basically he was a political reformist who was opposed to the industrial revolution okay that's weird but okay but at the same time, maybe it would have been better if more people were opposed to the Industrial Revolution, and maybe if more people were like, hey, let's uh, let's be a little bit more, you know, conservative towards how we're approaching how much we're burning. Yeah, that was definitely not anything that was on their radar at the time. No, that's fair. Um, but there was one account in his... Uh, novel we'll say well it's not a novel because it's not fiction well it might be fiction in his book um, okay that had a subtle cryptopedia spin to it Ooh, i like it okay so i showed him an old elm tree which was hollow even then into which i when a very little boy once saw a cat go okay that was as big as a uh this is very weird because he has a comma <laughs> older writing is terrible um, it's the worst yeah i think uh, this is so weird uh that was big as a middle-sized spaniel dog for relating which i got a great scolding for standing to which i at last got a beating but stand to which i did still um there's a period here which is very uh, whatever <laughs> uh, th this if, if I read a human being who wrote this in modern times, I would yeah. really severely question their ability to write. Um, <laughs> I have since many times repeated it and would take my oath of it to this day. When in New, Br New, Br New Brunswick, <laughs> when in New Brunswick, <laughs> I saw the great wild gray cat, which is there called a Lucifer. And it seemed to me to be just such a cat as I had seen in Waverly. Okay, so my... What I got out of that is he saw a cat, he told someone he saw a cat, and they beat him. Yeah, I think his parents beat him. Okay. Um, Brutal. <laughs> I saw a cat get the beaten stick. Yeah, and it's also a middle-sized spaniel dog, which yeah. spaniels are pretty large. Like, But I guess basically what he's saying is he saw a larger-than-house cat cat. Okay. I think that's that's pretty much what I got out of that. Yeah. Um. So I did some research, and a Lucifer is an alternate way of naming uh the the Canada lynx. Okay. 
The Canada lynx is not endemic to Great Britain, as you should assume. Yeah, because it's in Canada. Yeah, they can be found in North America. Um, there is the Eurasian lynx, which okay. is located in mainland Europe and Asia, as one would expect. Um, no modern, no substantial modern populations exist in England. Yes. There were there were Eurasian lynx in Great Britain, mm-hmm. um, to the point that they were people were talking about reintroducing them to the region. Oh, okay. Um, but it's a whole bunch of British bureaucracy that I won't get into on the podcast. Um, long story short, it didn't happen. Okay. So uh, that being said, as I said before, they were living in the in the UK from. Uh, Somewhere between eighty and four twenty five A D, which is a wide uh a wide yeah. range. However, that's still like thirteen hundred years after its extinction that uh William Cobbett saw links. Gotcha. So um it's one as a result, it's one of the earliest accounts of what's known as an alien big cat in Great Britain. Okay. Um you... so so to one by alien, do they just mean not from Britain? Yes. Okay. Basically. So um, okay, gotcha. And two, um, we're already at two pictures of Cheetor. Yes, we are okay. at two pictures of Cheetor. Uh, the first one had uh, Tigatron as well. Excuse me. Um, <laughs> and I particularly like this uh, this little little tagline I put on this Cheetor picture. Did you know Cheetor is technically an alien big cat in more than one way? You're the worst. You I are know. the worst. That's I... that's you did crimes. It's about to get worse. Don't oh, worry. Don't man. Don't worry. It gets worse as the episode progresses. <laughs> um, as I said, an alien big cat, or phantom cat, it describes a cat larger than a domestic cat showing up somewhere where it shouldn't. Um, they're more or less a global phenomenon, with instances being reported in the U.S., so jaguars where they shouldn't be, pumas where they shouldn't be, mm-hmm. Luxembourg, China. Uh, uh, I think there were some in South America. It's kind of a... It's a super northern hemisphere thing. Yeah. Um, not surprisingly, I didn't see many in Africa. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that's that's to be expected, considering most big cats are not alien in Africa. Yeah. <laughs> that's where they and, like it. Yeah, that's where they like it. Uh, and of course, the main focus of this episode, Great Britain. Aha. Uh-huh. Um, because there's so many of them, and because there might be different explanations for different areas, I did focus this episode on Great Britain. I might come back to the topic in a future episode for mm-hmm. other things. Um, that being said, William Cobbett was not the first instance of a story that may be attributed to an alien big cat uh, in the history of Great Britain, and more importantly, in the history of Surrey, the location that he first saw it. Um, well, basically, the dubious honor can be bestowed upon a mid-13th century incomplete Welsh poem from the, uh, Black Book of Carmarthen, uh-huh. Pa Gur. <sighs> so, uh, you might wonder why I didn't start with that. I'm gonna give you my shot at the original text. Okay. Which, let me remind you, is Welsh. <laughs> Oh, nice. 13th century Welsh. Yeah. No, that's the easy stuff, man. Yeah. E iskud ot mid urban kath paluk pan goikik tud poi gant kath paluk na ugen knuk e kuit in e bud na ugen kiran. I was not expecting you to actually read the left side of that block. And two, you put on like. A Monty Python accent while reading it? It's important. Okay. <laughs> you have to get in character. Yeah. If you don't get into character, you don't you don't succeed. Uh-huh. I mean, you know, I, I, I have to put this character on when I start reading the pot doing the podcast. Uh-huh. Because my normal character and my normal personality mm-hmm. is just so grating. Okay. And this is not grating at all. I promise you. <laughs> sure. So translated, this is uh, his shield was ready against Oath Palug, 
When the people welcomed him, who pierced the cat Paluk? Nine score before him before dawn would fall for its food. Nine score chieftains dot 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 because the poem got lost. <laughs> Probably because it was a Welsh poem. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, besides being literally unreadable to a late 20 somethings American in 2019, um, I did try my best. Uh, this text is also incredibly vague, and you need to know what a cat polog is, as it literally only appears six lines before the end of a poem uh, that we have today because the remainder of it was lost, as I said before. <laughs> The cat plug, or Pollog's cat, um, which is sometimes referred to as a clawing cat, is in essence a monstrous man-eating cat, having eaten, I think, 180 men in that, that poem, because that's nine score. Yeah. Uh, um, and is typically found in the Arthurian... Ar- wow. <laughs> I, I've, I've caught the unable to pronounce things bug. Arthurian <laughs> storytelling tr- tradition. So, King Arthur stories. Yeah. Um, according to legend, it was said to have been born to a sow, hen wen, which I think means white white sow, white pig. So it's a cat born of a pig. Yeah, it swam across the sea and it killed the 180 men I mentioned. It's pretty metal. Um, yeah, I've also heard it described as sea-like, um, like a sea, sea cat. And it also okay. had like brothers and sisters that were other various animals like i think one of them was an eagle but i didn't write that down because i didn't mm-hmm. really care um, <laughs> so pagur is an account of sir k killing the cat plug um jeffrey ash an arthurian historian believes that the cat pug was a leopard kept by an angsley chieftain um which was then elevated to a supernatural interpretation Mm-hmm. Um, of the story, in in the story, basically. So like, yeah. someone had a leopard that they got from like, you know, Africa or something like that, and Fed it like, people. oh, yeah, look at this thing, and he used it to be intimidating. Lick, lick, um, chomp. Yeah, which you know that actually kind of sounds pretty reasonable to me. Yeah, for an explanation. Um, however, in either context, it is the first instance of a British alien big cat. Because mm-hmm. if it's supernatural, it should belong there. And if it's a leopard, it doesn't belong there either. At first, <laughs> I thought you were going to talk about, like, cats driving spaceships. I wish. That's another <laughs> podcast, though. That's that's the Beast Wars fan cast. Oh, yes. Best fan cast ever after the Magic the Gathering Arena fan cast. Mm-hmm. That was last week's episode. Yes. This is a Beast Wars episode. Um... As a footnote, <laughs> the cat plug appears in the Fate Grand Order series, which I've included an image in the show notes. Uh, I was wondering where that was from because that's yep. definitely not what was in that poem. Nope. And it's self-described as uh, the beast of calamity that bears the characteristic of ever exceeding the strength of an opponent, growing unto maturation by the conflict that arises amongst men, feeding upon their envies and regrets. Fantastic. Um, That's a little too adorable for that description. Yeah, it's it's something. It is something. <laughs> uh, I should also note that that section literally took me three days to write. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I have at least six sources for that section. <laughs> <laughs> because it was a nightmare to do research on. I believe it. Um... So, there are modern tales of alien big cats, because otherwise I wouldn't be doing this. Just keeping tally, we're at four Cheetors. Uh, yes, we are four Cheetors, because this includes Transmetal Cheetor and Non-Transmetal Cheetor. And the subtop, the, 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 the description of this picture is Modern Boy. Yup. <laughs> <laughs> so, while interesting, the cat Pelog is a legend... And has litter bearing on modern times. Cobbett's Lucifer, however, was the start of a trend in Surrey, which would can carry into the 20th century. Um, the current interest in alien big cats did see a spike after the Surrey Puma, which started appearing really in 1958. Okay. So Surrey is a pretty predominant, like, 
Like, it's a pretty noteworthy alien big cat. Yeah. Um, of Great Britain. Because Surrey is actually just a little south of uh, London, I found out. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's close enough to a major population center that it will register on, you know, bigger... Um, uh, like, it will hit more people. Yeah, but at the same time, it's you know still a smaller area and all that. Yeah, it's kind of it's stuff. regional, but it's close enough to a big city where like once word gets out to the city that it'll spread. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So I got a timeline of these events from a 2010 BBC article: Surrey Puma sightings timeline in paranormal London. Okay. Oh. Oh. Wait. Wait. <laughs> I should have uh, put a better separator there. Uh -huh. maybe, maybe an Oxford comma because they're two separate things. Surrey gotcha. Puma sightings timeline, and then a separate thing that was a book, Paranormal London. Gotcha. Yeah, I should have probably read that better. But regardless, um, <laughs> when available, I'm going to mention any primary sources I found because most of it's coming from these two sources. So the second sighting in Surrey was made by Irene Roberts in July of 1937. In her letter to the Field magazine, she recounts that she was kept awake one early July morning by the cries of a peculiar intensity, expressing, it seemed, mortal fear and physical pain. What? Yeah. Um, she was unable to identify the sound, but she asserted that the creature was certainly not a fox. The, okay, okay. That's yes. most sounds, I would say. Most sounds are definitely not a fox. Hey, listen. There was a very, very seminal piece about six years ago that discussed what the kind of sounds foxes make. That is true. It's very important. And I believe one of them was Hachi, Hachi, Hachi cow, Hachi, Hachi, Hachi cow. Ah, uh, yes, I remember that uh, mm -hmm. research. Yes, it's a, it's a very important piece. I recommend everyone see it. Yeah. I still actually really like it a lot. Also, there's a companion piece to that particular piece of research in uh, investigative reporting mm -hmm. that uh, discusses uh, Stonehenge. Ah, yes. Both of which very valuable cultural artifacts, and I submit, should be included in the Library of Congress. They might actually be included in the Library of Congress because that's what the Library of Congress does. <laughs> um, so... That's pretty much it. No sighting, no nothing. Just heard a weird sound. And I, I think this is one of those things where people attributed something to something else. Mm -hmm. Whatever. Skipping ahead, in 1955, Abinger Hammer was walking her dog in Surrey when she found the mutilated remains of a calf. She then reports that she saw the culprit leaving the scene. Um, the, although That's hmm? a, just a dope name. Abinger Hammer. Yeah, it is a pretty dope name, but I assume I'm mispronouncing it. Because Could be it Abinger, maybe. Maybe Abergine. No, I... that's an eggplant. Eggplant hammer. Yeah. Uh, for that's... real for like uh, Abergine is, is how they say eggplant in the UK. <laughs> yes, I know. Okay. <laughs> uh and another weird one that I found out about. Um Coriander. Al What's coriander? Uh, I cilantro. think I might know this. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, and check this one out. Aluminium. Huh? Yeah, that's awful. That's yeah. terrible. That's that's a crime against humanity. Yes. Um, so, when she saw the culprit leaving the scene, uh, there is some contention over whether it sprang or slinked away between my two sources. Okay. <laughs> Which, to me, seems somewhat important, but whatever. Um, the mutilator appeared to be a larger ginger cat, which resembled a puma. Ah. Uh, um, I which think should it's be more noted. of a warthog. <laughs> Chupa thingy. <laughs> Unicorn. Uh, what were all the, the bits? Uh, I don't remember. <laughs> I gotta rewatch that series. It's also 7.27 p.m. My funny bone is slowly draining. <laughs> um, or maybe it's getting better. Limp? Uh, I okay. Limp? Yeah, you got a limp funny bone? Oh, I feel gross now. Yeah. 
Um, the fervor. Oh, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, okay. did I freeze? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. It I'm happens. still here. Or okay. was I just sitting very still? Maybe both. Uh, the fervor of the sum. <laughs> <laughs> do you need do you need an adult i do need an adult <laughs> he's trying to say the fervor of the story puma <laughs> yes um kicks off in 1959 at this point the reports shift from a handful of every couple of years to multiple sightings per year um well i couldn't track down literally any police reports <laughs> uh the bbc article at this point says that there was a flap of big cat sightings in the surrey hampshire border um a flap just means to... like a, a bunch like a like yeah. a, they just showed up out of nowhere just a bunch yeah okay um so according to phantom hitchhikers and other urban legends by albert jack this lack of reporting was due to local law enforcement not taking the reports seriously true yeah, yeah although all reports were given by people carrying a towel yeah, you got to watch out for them. They yeah. did start going crazy saying that the world was had ended. Yeah. Um and that a Vogon constructor fleet had destroyed it. Yeah. Um one of them with ginger hair had this weird like black thumb. I think he stole it off of a dead body. It's kind of like <laughs> a it's kind of like a, a, a what's the name of it? A hand of glory. Yeah. It's kind of weird, but it's regardless weird. We'll, Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll uh we'll let let uh Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy references lie. <laughs> um, so, one report, which was mentioned in documentation of this flap, occurred when a Mr. Birmingham was traveling down a secluded country road. Which, if you're getting Dover Demon vibes, yeah, you should probably get them. Yeah. <laughs> it's always just dudes going down a secluded country road that see all the oh, cool stuff. Yeah, or people who are high on mushrooms. Or people had, yeah, that's true too. Yeah. So that night he saw a large cat crossing the road reportedly 40 yards away, which is, I want to point out again, a pretty large distance. Yeah. Um, Mr. Birmingham stopped to observe the Labrador sized creature, which for me is like the weirdest re point of reference ever. Yeah. Like, why not just say big dog or whatever? Yeah. And he said that it had a definite feline gait. Uh -huh. So I assume it's it was, you know, hopping around and then it pushed a bunch of stuff off the table. It was just pushing shit off of tables. Yeah. <laughs> um, he continued to observe the creature for some time when it eventually moved out of sight. So reports like this continue into the modern times with the last report I could find being somewhere in the past decade. Um. Most of the reports follow this pattern, and as a result, I'm not reading them. <laughs> fair. Very I, fair. I, I was originally going to go through the timeline of events, and then as I was reading the timeline of events, which I began to realize was not written by, like, a BBC author, but I think a local, like, person who collects big cat stories. Yeah. Um, I just began to realize that they all are basically the same story. I saw a cat. <laughs> I saw a cat. I saw a cat. Um, so just assume that I read that for an hour. Okay, fantastic. So I've saved you some time. This is why this episode took so long. <laughs> there are, however, three noteworthy sightings. Um, in 1964, 66, and 2005. We got a I gap am, there. There is a gap, and I am becoming decidedly nauseous reading this. Oh, man. I don't know why. <laughs> So, in the autumn of 1964, the Goldeming police located in Surrey, and I'm not reading the, I'm not reading the, the end of the show notes. What's happening? <laughs> um, they had a plaster cast of a pug mark more than five inches across. What's a pug mark? I think it's a paw print. Okay. That's, that's what uh, Context Clues told, told me. Um, supposedly, this plaster cast was of a Surrey panther's paw print um, it was an imprint of just a pug that laid in the mud it was just a pug face yeah it had like the tongue the tongue was licking the nose at the time so it was like yeah 
That's what dogs sound like. <laughs> That's what pugs sound like. Yeah. That was audio poison. Oh my god, I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, the second event was taken in 1966, which was a uh, occurred in 1966. Man. Okay. Got to should read the copy. And it was a photo of an apparent puma. Not a puma. Not a puma. Not a puma. I can tell not you it's a not puma. a puma. Yeah. It, there's a picture in the show notes, and it looks like a big house cat. Yeah. It's just a big house cat. Yeah. Um, I would by say in- not even like a house cat where like, if you'd be like, oh, shit, that's a big house cat. You'd just be like, it's a pretty big house cat. Yeah. It, yeah. it was supposedly taken by an ex-police officer in a church garden. Um, the photo that I found was on a sketchy web page that was only captured by web archive. Okay. And, uh, it definitely looks like a house cat with white paws. Yeah. Like a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, according to the BBC article, however, and this is hilarious, the local Chessington zoo and natural history museum believed that it was a puma. Not a puma. Yeah. The London zoo was like, no, that's not a puma. Yeah. Um, the amount of things in the story that are literally just, oh, yeah, that's definitely a big cat. And then someone else saying, no, that's, that's not a big cat. <laughs> that's like, it, it's like a lot of a lot of people saying, oh, I saw this thing. And then someone come, turning around and saying, yeah, that's not the thing that you said it was. <laughs> Fair. It, it's, it's staggering the amount of times that happens. Like, yeah absolutely staggering so the final uh sighting that i'll cover here was in 2005 when an amateur videographer harry fowler captured the surrey panther in the winkworth arboretum okay arbitorium it's one of those two um the surrey wildlife trust ranger mark havler believed the creature captured in the video to be a lynx alleging that the creature could be feeding on local fauna. Um, I was literally not able to find the video of this. Okay. And it took a fair amount of time to find stills. And the stills that I did find, which are reproduced in the show no- in the the, the uh, episode copy um, and linked in the show notes, they're not impressive in any way. Yeah, there's not enough context to really tell what you're looking at in the photograph. It's really through a tree, and you see that there's a shape, but yeah. not you can't really tell what it is. So it could be basically anything. The first thing I, I, I see when I look at that picture, and I'll just... This is why I say it's not a good picture. Um, that if anyone sees anything, it's probably pareidolia. is because what I see is um, a, a person, like, crouched over like mid dab so there's yeah, like two legs on I, the bottom and they're bending over and then they got the arm going out to the they're, it's a it's a human mid dab is what i see it, in that photograph which is why i say it's probably not a good photograph it definitely looks like a human mid dab <laughs> and i hate that that's a thing <sighs> uh, 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 <laughs> yeah. this is this this let me let me reiterate. This is probably the longest amount of time it took to research an episode for me yet. Oh man, <laughs> it was so like <sighs> it's like pulling it was, teeth sometimes. It was so upsetting how much of this was just like, yeah, that's probably a house cat. Oh, that's a person dabbing. <laughs> oh yeah, that's probably just a dog print. Like, so much of it. Yeah. There was, like, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to spoil this episode. There was no good payoff. (laughs) (laughs) There rarely is. So, Surrey isn't the only region in Great Britain to have its share of alien big cats. Um, For the next creature, let's travel to the southern peninsula of England to the Budman Moor of Cornwall. I like me a good moor. Yeah. Um... This is... Oh man, we're gonna have to cut. <laughs> this episode's gonna be so short because half of it's me yawning. <laughs> like, 
I'm so disappointed. I, I yeah. thought Inlay and Big Cats were going to have so much more legs. Yeah. Because I thought there was going to be like a whole bunch of cool sightings and like wild things happening. But they all are the same thing. This one goes, hey, I think I saw a big cat. And then all the people are like, go, yes or no? Yes. That's literally what it is. I've so, got a little cat's tummy right now. Aw. Yeah. I wish I had a cat's tummy. <laughs> <sighs> so, <sighs> I went to Cornwall's tourism site. Okay. And the Beast of Budman was has its own article there. Nice. Which generally means that a thing is not a tourism thing at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it had a picture of the Bo- the Beast of Budman Moor. And let me tell you that it's totally not a house cat in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. I mean, it's – it's. here's the th- problem with that photograph. There's no context. You see a grainy black cat standing in grass, but there's not enough – it's zoomed in and blown up so much. It looks like it's taken from a larger picture and blown up. They removed all context, so you have no way to judge scale to mm-hmm. it. So it could either be like a big black puma or just a normal black house cat in grass. Mm-hmm. But there's not really enough context for you to say. I'm leaning towards house cat. And the reason I would say that is the height of the grass is covering the bottom of the cat's belly. I'd say more importantly, it doesn't have the face of a puma at all. True. Like literally at all. It it, it looks yeah. like the black cat that I that terrorizes my house. Yeah. Zero like, the terrible. The terrible. Um so most reports of the beast of Boudman Moor start more more start in nineteen ninety five, when after a rash of around sixty sightings of a black panther like cat three to five feet long and okay. reports of animal mutilation triggered an investigation by the British government. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Um, the investigation carried out by the agricultural development advisory service. I was the, partially hoping you'd say the Royal army. That would be phenomenal, but unfortunately it was not the Royal army. <laughs> no, that'd be fantastic. Get that cat. We need <sighs> grenades. Yeah. This is an America. No. No. Other countries don't just instantly resort to blowing things up. No. Russia might. So, the investigation failed to yield literally any evidence of a big cat in the region. (laughs) The conclusion of the report was as follows. No verifiable evidence for the presence of a big cat was found. There is no significant threat to livestock from a big cat in Budman Moor. I like how the uh the scottish try to tell the difference between a wild cat like a large wild cat and a house cat and they just, they just shake cat food because <laughs> a wild cat won't have the context and a house cat will just come running towards you <sighs> so if it doesn't Thanks. if it doesn't get excited and come towards you then it's a wild cat uh-oh <laughs> it's fantastic Yeah, I also lost you for a second there. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. I did too. It's just mostly me chuckling a little bit. I think evenings we get worse connection because more people are streaming Netflix. You know, that's probably right. <laughs> Actually, that's almost definitely right. Um, oh, Chun's father. Uh, <laughs> so... <sighs> This, this so this is about to get really upsetting for me. Okay. Um, so conclusions reached in the report: the presence of big exotic cats in the Boudman area and their possible impact on livestock. At Math 1995 asserted that the evidence found by the public does not indicate a big do- cat, but rather large dogs or house cats. Okay, seems more feasible. The investigation was criti- criticized by some. In that it didn't perform enough evidence gathering. Okay. Yeah. They, their their evidence methodologies, their, their investigation methodologies were interviewing people who had seen it. Okay. So here's what I have to say. If you do a meta-analysis of the data that's available to you, and you determine 
that it's just house cats or big dogs, mm-hmm. why would you go and tramp around a moor looking for house cats and big dogs? Yeah. Like, if anything, that would be more wasteful than just, you know, saying, yeah, we probably we think this is probably dogs. Mm-hmm. So, whatever. Shortly after the report was released, however, a 14-year-old boy found a big cat skull in the river Fowey, Fowey, which is located in the Boudin Moor, and I want you to click on that like. Oh, boy. Oh, it's a video. Oh, no! <laughs> I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't that. <laughs> gotcha good. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's definitely a dramatic chipmunk to that, I yeah, feel like. Yeah, good use. Um... So the skull eventually makes its way to the desk of Daphne Hills, one of the Natural History Museum's mammal specialists. Nice. Okay. And I got a little picture of them right there. Yeah. Um, Basically, what they did was they did a comparison of the skull to a bunch of other skulls that they have, which is basically how you do this kind of thing. Right. Uh Uh-huh. It's uh, you do categorization. You look up taxonomies. You look at other samples and. You get a best guess. I mean, yeah. that's just what you do. So Daphne Hills identified the skull as belonging to a leopard, meaning a big cat not endemic to the UK, right? Yeah. So when examining the skull, an insect egg case was spotted, which belonged to a cockroach species that would not have been found living on the moor. The moor. Um, that's important because cockroaches live in hot, humid areas like tropical regions um they don't typically show up in cold misty foggy england yeah they might show up in the houses but not not the more um additionally there were fine cut marks found on the skull which means that it was most likely belonging to a, a leopard that had been prepared as a trophy uh, and then at some point been dropped into the river as a hoax. I think it's more likely evidence that someone fought and killed a leopard with their bare hands and left it there, but also they had cockroaches. Mm, okay. And then they they did a lie bath to, you know, completely strip away all the, yeah. the skin and the flesh. But for some reason, the uh, the the egg case stayed there. Yes, exactly. Okay, cool. Um, So the tourism site alleges that there was footage taken of the beast in 1998. However, literally every video I found online was a prank or me video. Oh, I'm serious. Google beast of Boodman Moore video. You will find a ton of prank videos. One of them being (laughs) a Rickroll. Oh, fantastic. Yes, yes. I was. I had a lot of fun with that one. Uh-huh. So, that being said, there is an alternate explanation for the beast. Okay. Wow, that was a terrible sentence I wrote. <laughs> so, um, there's also another picture of the Beast of Budman, uh, which I found in a Telegraph.uk article. I would say I doubt I have my doubts about that yeah. being the thing. Yeah, it looks an awful lot like a house cat again. Yeah, which that's that's the main problem is bad pictures of house cats can look like big bad pictures of big cats because they're cats. Yeah. So the final like coda to the the Surrey Panther, uh, not the not the Surrey Panther, but the Beast of Boudin Moor. Um, there was a woman, Mary Chipperfield, which I read somewhere and I couldn't find. Like, it was one of those things where I was doing research and I found this thing. Yeah. Supposedly, the zoo is based off of We Bought... Like, the zoo in We Bought a Zoo yeah. was based off of the Plymouth-based oh. zoo that she was in. But okay. I can't re-find that um, thing. Which, if you yeah. don't know, is it's a it's a Kevin James vehicle. Uh-huh. Meaning it's phenomenal. Meaning it's a Segway. Yeah. <laughs> oh man parkour ninjas was great so 
she had claimed to have released three of her favorite Pumas into Dartmoor um, and Boodman and all that stuff after her Plymouth-based zoo was shut down in 1978. Oh, good. Um, this is important because the Dangerous Animal Act was passed in 1981, and she was not report. She was not obligated. Obligated. Oh, to report. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, so it is feasibly possible that it was Pumas that people saw. Yeah. However, that being said, um, the impact that that kind of creature, like an apex predator, and I looked at the types of animals that are endemic to the region. Yeah. And right now, there's almost no apex predator. Like, the apex predator of... England is basically a fox. Oh, okay. So, if Pumas ended up in the mix, I have a feeling that it would, like, totally devastate the region. Yeah. If they survived. Mm hmm Which makes me think that they probably didn't make it through. Yeah. Um, just because three Pumas, if there was a breeding... If, they, if there was, like, you know, a male and two females or two males and a female, they would have been able to breed at least a little bit. Um, yeah. And the way that breeding works with animals is you end up getting more and more. And if an ecosystem can't support it, it collapses and, you know, the predators die out. And mm -hmm. It's a whole thing. And yeah. there's, not an evident, there's not enough evidence to support that they thrived in the region. No, and then something else about um, the well, like England and um, Scotland and, and and the islands and that is that they used to just hold hunts, and that's part of the reason why there's like no predators. <laughs> it's because like there were there were just hunts, right? Because like on the Scotland episode, like they know the day that they killed like the last of specific animals and shit like that. Yes. So yeah. that, like. <laughs> With that, so they just kill all of a thing, and then that thing is just gone. Yeah, pr pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. It's it's that's basically how that all all of this goes. Because ultimately, most of the big cat sightings that I found are either pareidolia or human perception just being flawed. Which I guess yeah. is pareidolia in its own right, but I mean that in the sense of like the way that we look at the world is ultimately inefficient. Yeah. Um, there are some instances, which I didn't mention here, where an actual cat was found, both dead okay. and alive. Um, however, they... Wait, a oh, single cat, both dead and alive? Yes, a Schrodinger's, it was Schrodinger's cat. cat. Okay, you got the joke. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they did find a Schrodinger's cat once. Uh -huh. um, but then he died. <laughs> and then he came back to life. Oh, shit. And then he died again. Oh, man. Don't um, keep this it, up nine times. Yeah, I know. It, it happened a lot. So, uh, I would have loved to, ha like, I thought, okay, there's a ton. Of, I know I've heard about alien big cats. There's a ton of sightings. There's going to be so much to talk about. It's literally all the same. Oh, man. It's literally, like, almost every sighting plays out the same way there was yeah. one where it was like a, a cardboard cutout oh that's pretty good i like that there was one where it was like one of those like tiger plushes from the fair yeah um most of them are just like nonsense there's a few cases where an animal escaped a zoo but in uh -huh. most of those cases it died oh yeah well because it was in a zoo yeah so basically Alien big cats, they might be actual sightings of things that escape zoos, but I don't think that they're either survivor species, which, in general, the whole notion of survivor species is always suspect. I mean, yeah. yes, the coelacanth did survive, mm -hmm. but the coelacanth's kind of the exception to the rule. Yeah. In general. Um, and additionally, I saw a lot of people almost calling them like a spiritual creature, Kind of like the Black Shuck from episode six. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, 
that's always a that's always such a hand wavy explanation for things. Yeah. So ultimately, while it's a wild phenomena, it's a pretty mundane it has a pretty mundane explanation in most cases. And just as a heads up for those who want to keep track, we are at five cheat whores. Yep. And <laughs> this one's turns into a two cheat whore, which is slightly nightmarish. It is I liked so I liked uh Transmetal and Transmetal 2 Cheetor because they were both badass. Yeah. Transmetal... Oh, that, that's just enough said. They're, they're, they're just badass. Yeah, Transmetal 1 Cheetor is my, like, legitimately... Your favorite? So, yeah. Uh, literally... What are, you, what are your top five Cheetors in order? <sighs> okay. Uh, that's going to be... Ooh, man. Now that now that Masterpiece Cheetor has been released, that's that, that throws a monkey wrench at all of this. Okay, so we've got Transmetal 1, though, at the top Transmetal of the list. Transmetal 1 is number one. Definitely okay. without a doubt. Without a doubt, Transmetal 1 is the top of the list. Um, for its detail, I'm going to put uh, Masterpiece Cheetor on the list next. Okay. Um, let's see. The next one is going to be uh, Original Deluxe Class Cheetor. Okay. I like that one a lot. Um, it's pretty fun. It's got a lot of play value. It's part of the reason... It, it's the reason Cheetors are my... Cheetahs are my favorite animal. That uh -huh. exact toy. Um, then it's going to be, uh, Transmetal 2 Cheetor. Okay. Um, Night Slash Cheetor has a special place in my heart. So okay. that's, uh, let's see, what number are we at? One, that was two, five. Four, five. Uh, yeah. well, I'm going to finish the list. Okay. I know them all. Um, then it's going to be the Bakan Cheetor, but that's not really a Cheetor toy. That's a clocker toy. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's six. Uh... The, uh, what's his name? Um, the Bakan Cheetor that was purple. That one's mm -hmm. that one's next on the list. Um, it was a repaint of Thundertron. Then uh, b b uh Titanium Series Cheetor is number eight. We got the um, oh what else is there? I'm gonna put Universe Cheetor at nine. Okay. Uh, Mega Cheetor from the Beast Machines line is 10. Uh, am I forgetting any? Um, uh, the last one is Supreme Class Cheetor, which mm -hmm. is number 11, and that's the absolute worst. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'm, a, that, I'm, I'm uh, legit surprised at the, uh, the top five list because I thought – that uh, Transmetal 2 Cheetor would have been higher on the list. Uh, I, I didn't have a Transmetal 2 Cheetor growing up. Gotcha. Um, and I'm glad we're doing this at the end, so if people... Re oh, Alpha Trizer was the name of the purple Cheetor. Gotcha. Um, I'm glad we're doing it at this at the end of the list, because if someone does not enjoy my, my <laughs> obsession with Beast Wars, they can just leave at this yeah. point. Um, which is great. I like to give people that option. Yeah, I thought for sure it was going to be... Uh, Transmetal 2, Transmetal 1, OG, and then just the rest. But yeah, they, I, you spread them out. You, the, your order surprised me. Well, uh, in my order, uh, you know, it's fat. It's not a hard and fast ordering. Yeah. Um, because for me, Transmetal 1 is always at the top. Okay. Um, the original Cheetor is always in the top three. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of mishmash from there. Gotcha. Right. Um, although an honorable mention in something that I really wish had been produced uh -huh. uh, is Trans Tech Cheetor, which was a version. Of, oh, I totally forgot. Yeah. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, man, this throws the whole list into, <laughs> into disarray. <laughs> so there was an animated Cheetor based off of Blur from Animated. Uh huh. Um, which was then actually based off the original Trans Tech Cheetor, <laughs> which is the coolest thing ever, and yeah. it's definitely oh man, that's def that's actually number five. I'm pushing Transmetal Two off the list. Oh no shit! Yep, yep. Transmetal wow. Two is now off the list for uh, animated Cheetor, which is not on the TF Wiki site, huh? Think you got to fix that wiki. Hmm. That's interesting. 
<sighs> All right. Well, that's been enough of uh, me talking about Beast Wars. <laughs> um, as always, if you want to find out more about the podcast, visit CryptopediaCast.com. On Instagram, we're at CryptopediaCast. Same on Twitter. Uh, if you want to email us, you can email us at us at CryptopediaCast.com. We have a Patreon. Uh, we thanked our jackalopes last week. If you are interested in getting a shout out on the show, make sure you uh, go to the Jackalope tier and you'll also get access to some wonderful side pro- podcasts. And I think by the time that this comes out, we should have released another Lover's Lane. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. That's, I've been. I've I got to sh- check that spreadsheet. I've got to record just another bonus one for the future. I think by w- within the next two weeks, I've got to get my next episode recorded and I've got to get a bonus recorded just to have it in the can. Yeah, my, my plan is to um, tr- I'm I'm shooting for like your uh, like a lover's lane or uh, what is it Daisy Field Lily Field Daisy Field Lily Field? yeah Lily Field well Lily Field. it's I'm not super concerned about who goes up when I just well, want to have something available in the can when that time comes around to to post them. Well, the way that I've been doing it is on the 14th I release one of yours, and then at the end of the month I release one of mine. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm trying to to stagger it so that you get two that the, the patrons get two two a month. Okay. Yeah. Um. I like how we're having this conversation. On <laughs> Trust the, on air. On air. <laughs> so um, we also has a have a has have a Facebook group. Um, if you like the podcast, rate, review, subscribe. Um, if you have any monster requests, stories, monster sources, I, me and Brandon, both appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if you got any creepy pasta or creature pasta, I don't think I'm gonna do that anymore. What? Fine, I'll well, do it. Sub- submit it. <laughs> we just don't have submissions. <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that's the main reason why I'm not doing it. Yeah. Uh, you could find me on Instagram at donkey underscore hands. My website is boyerb.com. My email is brandon at cryptopediacast.com. And again, that's Brandon. With an O at the end, no other letters, that's treason. You can find me on Twitter at Crypto Brandon, capital C, capital B, and you can find me on Magic the Gathering Arena as Donkey Space Hands. No underscore, it's just a space this time. You need the account number for that too. Oh, I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know mine either. I'm Gorgo the Wise. <laughs> um, if you want to get in contact with me, I'm at U2057 on Instagram, and on Twitter, I'm at JF Dunham. Uh, my website is johndunhamgames.com, and my email is john at cryptopediacast.com. Our art was done by Tom Hill. You could find him on Instagram at Thomas Michael Hill. His website is greatergloryco.com, and his email is tommikehill at gmail.com. As always, I'm John. I'm Brandon. And things are way past the point of getting weird. 